Hi everyone, I'm here in the Apple Chapel of Peter Hinzen. Peter wrote one of the chapters in my new book, The Offer You Can't Refuse, and I'm here to interview him about those ideas because I want to share them with all of you. So Peter, thanks for writing a chapter in my uh, new My pleasure. Book. I yeah. appreciate that. And um, I think it's very useful for people who will read the book because I'm sharing some ideas about the future of customer experience, how digital becomes a commodity, how you need to become a partner in life, how you need to look for added value for society. Uh, many people tell me afterwards, we like the ideas, Stephen, but how do we need to work with that? How can we evolve from some good ideas to actual execution with impact and that's exactly where your chapter is about um, and feel free to explain it to everyone who's watching how you think this should be done. Sure, I, I, uh, I actually got an inspiration from one of the uh, examples that I have in, in my book The Phoenix and the Unicorn. I was, I was really looking for traditional companies who could reinvent themselves because I think this is where innovation plays out in the most extreme form. Okay. If you start from scratch and do something unique Okay, I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's relatively easy. I mean, a lot of respect for the unicorns, but I think the phoenixes who have to reinvent themselves is even more difficult. So mm -hmm. that's why I really wanted to see how these traditional companies did that. Okay. And one of the companies that uh, I was researching is Medtronic, the, the, the pacemaker company as they're known, but they're the largest medical device company in the world, more okay. than $30 billion in, uh, in revenue. And they did a very interesting take on innovation with what I call the hourglass model. And, and we all know the shape of the hourglass, right. uh, the top of the hourglass. This is the, the wide lens that you need now. Uh, we're in a world, and I don't have to explain it to you, but that is changing faster than ever before. Mm -hmm. We have to be more alert. We have to look outside of our normal field of vision. So nobody stays in their lane. So it's really important to have a wide lens of new ideas. But then you need to filter it. Mm -hmm. Then you need to follow that shape of the hourglass and figure out that's what we need to do. And that requires experimentation, um, trying things, failing, learning from mistakes. I think this is one of the most crucial things to get right, also from a cultural point of view, uh, the whole psychological safety. Mm -hmm. But going from that wide lens and then figuring out what to do, and then it falls into the bottom half of that hourglass. And this is where you scale and run it for efficiency. Okay. And I think what you see is that in the last century, we've actually built a lot of companies for scale and efficiency. So that's why companies have a really big bottom half of that hourglass. I mean, they, they run their business like Swiss clockwork machines. But how do you align that top part with the bottom part? And how do you make sure that there's a good balance between that wide lens and experimentation and then the scaling and running yeah. it in the most efficient way? Because what we often see in companies is that top part of the hourglass is filled with innovation people, uh, the disruption team, those kind of people. And there's often a disconnect between that small group and the large organization. And I often feel that people who are in the scaling part of the business don't take the innovators always that serious. So how, how do you need to deal with that? Yeah, I think that alignment is absolutely crucial. I mean, we've seen so many examples where you have brilliant ideas and brilliant innovators, exactly. and then it falls into non-fertile yeah. ground and it's just completely lost. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, what you also have is you know, a really machine-like structure that isn't willing to listen to the innovator. So the alignment is absolutely crucial. But also, I think what is crucial is what I call mutual respect. I mean, the innovators have to understand the only way they can look at the day after tomorrow is because there is a machine that is making money and turning a profit. Exactly. But at yes. the same time, the people who run the machine he, need to feel that, thank God we have those people in the top part of the hourglass who are thinking about the day after tomorrow and who are making sure that they can reinvent themselves so there is a next machine to be very profitable. Yeah. I think that alignment is crucial. Getting the balance right but also understanding that it might be two completely different types of cultures. Maybe there's a different mentality or culture in the top than in the bottom half. Maybe different people. And I think making sure that you have that type of an, an, a vision 
where you align those cultures and align those mechanisms, I think that is absolutely crucial. Do you know examples of companies who did a good job in aligning those two cultures? Well, I mean, if you look at some of the phoenixes, you, you often see the same patterns coming again. Okay. Uh, when you look at, for example, say a Disney, mm -hmm. uh, where they've used acquisitions, of course, to have input for new ideas, but where they figured out how to really make sure that this becomes a mainstream part of the machine. A company like Microsoft is one of my big heroes. I mean, Microsoft is probably one of the biggest transformations in the last decade, going mm -hmm. from a licensed business to a completely cloud-based business, and then figuring out how to take those ideas. And, and I think if you look at the, the Satya Nadella um, era mm -hmm. and compare it to the previous, I mean, Steve Ballmer was a really brilliant man to run the bottom half of that hourglass. I yeah. mean, it was a machine that was generating cash. Sales guy. Sales guy. Yeah. And they had brilliant R&D departments, but somebody said there's probably 10 Googles inside of Microsoft R&D, but they're not getting outside. Yeah. That was a really good example of a top half that wasn't picked up by the machine. I think what Satya Nadella did from the very beginning is make sure that there was an alignment where you take those new brilliant concepts and feed it into the machine to really transform the machine. I think those are really good examples of companies that you know, we can get inspired by. Yeah, and, and, and does that mean that success is completely depending on the top leadership? I think the cultural element of, of, of that uh, leadership and vision is extremely important. Yeah. Uh, maybe the most important you know, uh, inspiration for the Phoenix and the Unicorn was Walmart. Um, it was wonderful to spend um, time with them. They're the largest retailer in the world. They're the largest company in the world, two and a half million people. And although they're publicly quoted, they're still family owned. The, the, mm -hmm. the, the Walton family owns the majority shares. But the CEO, um, I think, was really crucial to make sure that they were playing the long game that they were doing the innovation and changing the machine at the same time, really changing the tanker. And I think if you don't have that top leadership commitment, who can actually understand both the new and the old, who can make the combination, I think it's very difficult to, to make that happen and to turn innovation into execution. Well, thanks, Peter. Uh, fantastic insights. I hope people will enjoy your chapter in my book. And yeah, this was a perfect summary. So thanks Wonderful. for that. Wonderful. And good thanks. luck with the book. Thank, Thank you. you.